going to talk about properties of waves, it's important to know the wave equation. Uh, first off, I really like this joke here. Calculating frequency, it's so easy, it hurts. <laughs> Actually, I've heard another one too where I said it mega hurts, right? But okay. So we'll do the wave equation. Um, oh, wait, I have another joke for you. Um, here's a really bad joke. Ready? If you saw a light wave, would you wave back? Mm. So we'll do the wave equation. Um, normally, it's written as V equals F lambda. Uh, but I think it shows up as C equals F lambda in your data book. Uh, either way, it's V or C equals F lambda. So we could also write it with a V here. It doesn't really matter. It could also be a V. So if we say V equals F lambda as well, well, that's also the same thing. What does this mean? Well, speed, that's V. So if we talk about the speed itself, um, what's speed measured in? That's in meters per second. And if it was light, right? if it was light, then do you know what the speed of light is? Do you hopefully know that? You should know that C is the speed of light, and it is really fast, right? It is, to remember. You don't have to remember, you can actually look it up, but it's three times 10 to the eight meters per second. That is pretty fast, right? That means it goes, uh, let's see, we can put it in kilometers, that would be times 10 to the five, so that would be 300,000 kilometers in one second. So that is pretty quick, yeah. If it's a speed of a wave, like a water wave or whatever, just put in V equals F lambda. If it's uh, light, then put in C equals F lambda, just because light speed is that value C. Uh, what about the frequency? The frequency, which is something we haven't quite talked about yet, but the frequency is measured in hertz, like that awesomeness there. They're so easy, it hurts. Um, or it can be in seconds to the minus one, because that's really what uh, it is. A hertz is one over a second. It's supposed to be like cycles per second. Think about your computer. The speed that your computer actually uh, does calculations. Don't we do it in hertz, like gigahertz? Right? That means in billions of calculations every second. So this idea of hertz and megahertz and gigahertz, that's really important, isn't it? So this is uh, actually pretty important to know about. Uh, then this, this is a Greek symbol, lambda. Lambda is the wavelength, and that's just measured in meters. So this is the wave equation. It's actually pretty straightforward. There's nothing really much to it. You'll be given, sometimes you'll actually have to use this. This is really a nice converter though between frequency and wavelength and vice versa. So if you start with frequencies and wonder what the wavelength is or wavelength and want to know what the frequency is, then this is a really good way to do it, I think. Uh, let's go here to features of graphs. Oh, I love this hipster dog here. This dog is so hipster, right? My favorite frequency is 50,000 hertz because that's what dogs can hear at. And of course, that's a frequency that we can't hear. That's why he's like, you probably never heard it before. Uh, what a douchey hipster dog. <laughs> so, uh, oh, that's just a cute dog. He's probably minding his own business and his owner probably, uh, or his person probably just put that around him. Um, don't want to trigger anyone with the word owner. It's true, you don't actually make own, but uh, there we go. Um, Features of graphs. If we're going to do displacement against position, and I'm going to do another graph of displacement versus time, they're going to be different. So I'll do a graph. Let's see here. Let's draw ourselves a nice uh, displacement versus position sort of graph, something like this. Now, we could have a number of features that we could actually try to measure. First of all, we could measure from the middle of the graph to the top of the graph, we could measure something we call the amplitude. Okay, the amplitude, and that's going to be measured in meters because we're measuring a length. Keep in mind that's also the same as this. That's also the amplitude, right? So it's the it's the distance that you go from the middle of this wave to the top or the middle to the bottom. That's the amplitude. And if we measure this distance across here, this distance from a peak to a peak, for example, like that distance right there. In this case right here, because it's position, we're measuring an actual length. Then we know this is going to be lambda, which is the wavelength. That's the thing we need to know about. And that's measured in meters. So this is really important. Now keep in mind, you could also measure the length uh, right here. The length of the wave can be done from the bottom to bottom here, what we call a trough to a trough. It can be a crest to a crest. It can be from the middle here to the next middle right here. It can be also here. This is also the wavelength here. There's a lot of ways of measuring you know, the period, as we call it, of a wave, or in this case, the wavelength. Uh, so there's a lot of ways of doing it. This is just one way. Um, we can also look at displacement versus time graph. So here we have a totally different thing. I'll just draw another wavy looking wave though, just to be sure. And it goes on forever. 
Um, and what we can do, of course, still, uh, the height is still the amplitude. So that hasn't changed. So this right here, still the amplitude. Like here with amplitude, still the amplitude there. Uh, but this time, the length that you're measuring here is something very, very different here. This length right here that you're measuring from here to here, think about it. That's a length that you measure in units of time. That's why we call this the period the period of oscillation. It'll be measured in seconds. So the period is going to be measured in seconds. So that'll be like the time it takes to do a full cycle. Or it could have been, you know, remember from a trough to a trough or from the middle to a middle, it'll still give you the period. So these are the main features you need to be able to do with graphs. You need to be able to look at a graph and tell what happens. Um, and I actually want to bring up a very typical kind of IB question, actually, now that I think of it. Um, they love to give you one of these graphs, especially with position, and they would say something like, um, I mean, it's not formally asked here, I didn't do it as a formal question, but I think it's really important. Imagine you have a wave like this, and what they'll do is they'll tell you, ah, you have some particles that are sitting along that wave. So let's just say you have um, some situation like this right here, and you have a, you know, a wave that's going like this, but they'll tell you the wave itself, they'll tell you the wave is actually traveling that way. Okay, and then they'll say, all right, you have a particle that's sitting right here, for example. What will that particle's motion be right here at this point? So what this means is that it's not allowed to move left and right. Okay, we're fixing the position here in this case. We'll fix the position. This will be displacement in meters as well. So what happens is, imagine this particle here. As this particle is just sitting right there. Imagine it's sitting right there. And what happens is this wave moves, but the particle stays in the same X position. So in order to stay on the wave, let me see, can I actually copy this thing here and then move it? Let's see here. So I take this wave now and I take it and I make it travel. Ah, good, this is good. Imagine that it moved a little bit. Now where is my particle? Can you see my particle is no longer here? It had to follow the wave. So now, do you see my particle went up? So can you see that? Does that make any sense? And as this wave moves over, my particle has to go up in order to follow that wave. So the question could be, you know, which direction is that particle moving? And you can see that particle goes up. Had the question been reversed? Uh, actually, let's start off, let's do something different. What about if we started with a particle like, um, yeah, we could do it over here, for example. As the particle goes, oh, we'll do it over here maybe. Like this, let's just say it was a wave just like this. We started like this, this was the initial starting condition, and we say, ah, this wave moves to the side again like this. What happens to that particle? Can you see that this particle, as the wave goes to the side, can you see that the particle has to actually drop down to stay there? That particle would have to drop down. So that's why in that case, that particle will be going down. I think of this as if I'm like, you know, trying to surf or something in the water and a big wave comes and hits me. Um, if I'm just sort of bobbing in the water, I, for the most part, will stay still. The wave will come and make me go up and down, but I won't move unless I'm obviously surfing. Then, of course, then I'm actually moving with the wave. Different story. I just mean if you're swimming in the water waiting for a wave, you decide you don't want that wave to hit you. Uh, you don't want to ride that wave, I mean. So you decide to just sort of be just part of the water. So that's a, uh, actually a pretty sim uh, typical kind of question you might be asked on IB exams. So that might be pretty important. Here. I'm just going to see if I can delete this. All right, now we have a frequency equation. This one, luckily, is really easy. It goes like this, and this one is in your data booklet. F equals one over T. This is the definition. Really important, data booklet, there you go. And we just have to remember what the frequency is measured in, just to remind ourselves again, it's always good practice to do this. Frequency, look at this, it's one over, oh well, let's do period first. T is a period, because that's in seconds. It's the amount of time, right? It's the amount of time you're measuring here. That's a period. Um, frequency then, if you look, frequency is one over period. That's why it's seconds to the minus one, which is otherwise known as hertz. So you could do hertz or second to the minus one. Well, there we go. That was okay, wasn't it? Um, very last thing, just a very minor uh, piece of information. I think it's important. We have transverse waves. That's where the direction of oscillation is perpendicular to the direction of travel. What does that mean? It's an example just like what I showed you with this water wave, for example, going like this right here, right? So what that means is that the oscillation is going up and down. You know, your little particles themselves, let's say you're a little person sitting in the water, your direction of oscillation will be up and down, and yet the actual wave will be traveling, in this case, maybe in that direction. So I'll say that's the direction of travel. So the travel direction might be that way, but your oscillation is up and down. Do you see they're 90 degrees to each other? That's why they're perpendicular. Same with light. Light does the same sort of thing. 
So for example, uh, I could draw it here. So I could have a uh, light like this. Now light is an oscillating electromagnetic field. So we could say maybe it's the magnetic field that's oscillating. This is the oscillation. Uh, keep in mind it's also in 3D, so there's a magnetic field and there's an electric field. And then those whole things are traveling, let's say, in that direction. In this case, let's say to the right. So that's the direction of travel. Travel, there we go. And longitudinal waves, by contrast, that's where the direction of oscillation is parallel. So these are the key words here. It's perpendicular and parallel to the direction of travel. How does that work? That's a little bit harder. It's maybe a bit more abstract. But uh, sound, for example, works this way. Right now, the fact that I can speak to you means in this room where I'm recording, uh, it's kind of weird to think about. Well, my throat is creating these standing waves, which is really weird to think about. Um, and those are actually vibrating some molecules of air. And those molecules of air are actually going into a microphone that I have, which is being picked up. You know, the, the, the vibrations in the molecules are being picked up by a microphone, which is then converted to a digital signal. And there you go. Um, but the direction of oscillation is parallel. So what that means, you have all these particles, let's just say. All right, we have a whole bunch of particles like this right here. And I'll draw a whole bunch of other particles like this. What's happening is it's kind of weird to see, but it's actually a direction of oscillation like this. So your particles themselves, like the air molecules in this case, the air molecules are actually going to be going, let's say it's going this way. So they're going to be going like this right here. The air molecules are going to be vibrating this way. They're oscillating left to right. And because of that, the direction of travel of the wave is also left to right. So that's why I said they're parallel. So for example, this right here, then that would, maybe that's the direction there of travel the wave. That's actually how uh, sound waves work. And that also explains why you need to have a me medium in which to have sound. That's why in space there is no sound, because there's no molecules to vibrate or to, to make them move back and forth. There's nothing there. That's why you can't have sound in space. Sorry, but you can have light, because light, an electromagnetic field, that can exist in a vacuum, no problem. That's why you have light in space, but you don't have sound. Sorry, space is really quiet. Sorry, space movies. <laughs>